My name is Michael Hayden. I'm the CEO of Prelenia Pharmaceuticals. I'm also the Killam Professor at UBC, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Talking about is pridopidine. It's a really unique drug that is a selective sigma-1 receptor agonist. Sigma-1 receptors are expressed in the brainstem, in the basal ganglia, and the cortex predominantly. And when activated, they actually provide neuroprotection. They have big impact on mitochondria. Mitochondrial functions improved. They increase the release of BDNF. They enhance autophagy. They decrease ER stress. They improve the connectivity in the brain. Uh, and all of this acts to promote neuronal health, particularly affecting brainstem, basal ganglia, and the cortex of the brain. Yeah, we're excited to present updated data on two important studies with pridopidine here at the AAN. The first that was just presented was the use of pridopidine in ALS. The second, which I'll be presenting tomorrow, will be the uh, study uh, updated data on the use of pridopidine in Huntington disease. Both of these diseases are really diseases for which there's inadequate therapies. In ALS, sadly, there was just the news about Amlex, and there's a real opportunity for drugs can, that can influence progression of the disease. In Huntington disease, there is no drug that has had any impact on progression in the disease. And because of its mechanism of action and the data that we have so far, we're excited about presenting this data to the broader community at the AAN. Well, let's start off with the ALS study. The ALS study, we were chosen to be part of the first platform study in ALS. Platform study allows faster recruitment because it shares placebo across multiple arms. We were able to be part of that study, and that was conducted by the Healy Center at, uh, at, uh, at Mass General Hospital, led by Merit Sykovitz. We were pleased to be able to complete the study on time with no serious adverse events. And the study included, uh, broadly, patients who had quite broad manifestations of disease, up to three years duration. And as you know, in ALS, patients can die anywhere from two to four years. So many of these patients were very advanced. This was a short-term study, 24 weeks. And so in an effort to further delineate where the drug may have benefit, we looked at those people who were definite, probable, and had less than 18 months duration. When we looked at that, uh, this was again uh, 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 essentially pre-specified. The results were quite uh, 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 surprising and uh, exciting. Firstly, we showed a slowing of progression in the ALS FRS, and this was seen at eight weeks, 16 weeks, and 24 weeks, and this was significant. This was, pr this was driven by all components of the ALS FRS, the scale respiratory, bulbar, and motor function. The biggest effect was on respiratory function. There you saw minimal changes in respiration, uh, any decrease in the patients treated compared to placebo, and this became significant. And then when you looked at the key uh, measure in respiration, which is shortness of breath, in fact, there was no change from baseline in patients on the drug compared to placebo, which had uh, a significant drop. In addition to that, speech was significantly improved in the whole population, as well as in, in this particular uh, population of definite early and less than 18 months. And in particular, those that contribute to intelligibility, including speaking rate and articulation rate, really remain stable compared to placebo when this went down. Also associated with this, there was a significant improvement in quality of life compared to placebo. This was primarily, as measured by the ALS Q40, this was primarily driven by uh, communication and eating and swallowing. Now, the sigma-1 receptor is highly expressed in the brainstem, and the brainstem is very important for those functions 
of uh, respiration, eating, swallowing, uh, and also speech. So it's perhaps not surprising that we might have seen predominant effects there. When we looked at survival in the first 20, uh, essentially the 24-week study, you saw no difference in survival. Uh, there were four deaths in placebo and three in predopinine. But as you went further and there was more time to see the effect, the patients went, were double-blinded uh, onto the open label. Everybody got predopidine. But what we saw is that one measure for survival is 50% survival probability. In other words, when would half the patients have died? And what you see here is that patients who had delayed start for predopidine, they had an effect at 300 days. But the patients who had been on predopidine right from the beginning had actually 50% survival probability of 600 days. So this was an increase in 300 days. This encouraging data that really hasn't been seen before in ALS, the effect on respiration, speech, uh, uh, and also bulbar function together with survival uh, enhancement, really uh, has led us to uh, get regulatory support for a single pivotal phase three study that we plan to start towards the end of 2024 in an effort to bring some hope uh, uh, to patients with ALS about a potential improved outcome. I'll be presenting the data on Huntington disease tomorrow. It's important to note that we, this what called proof, and this was the, uh, essentially the use of predopidine in outcome in HD, an outcome as measured primarily by progression. It's important to have two, two points in context. Firstly, there's never been a drug that any, had any impact on progression in HD. And secondly, it was known going into the study that certain anti-dopaminergics, in particular neuroleptics that are treated, used off-label for behavior, and career drugs might uh, uh, essentially mitigate and obscure the effects of our drug. The reason is our drug is a CYP2D6 inhibitor. Many of these drugs are metabolized by CYP2D6, and so what happens, you expect you might get three to five times the exposure with then the appropriate uh, uh, effects on sedation, somnolence, uh, extrapyramidal side effects, which can mask the effects in the functional assessment that we had. Uh, these uh, warnings are in the labels for these drugs already by the FDA and EMA. So we did the study. For the whole population, our study did not reach its primary or secondary endpoint. However, when you went to those patients who were not taking antidopaminergic medications, we started seeing uh, profound effects. Total functional capacity was maintained, and in particular, the key index for progression, CUHDRS, which measures total functional capacity, which has five domains, measures finances, activities of daily living, who cares for you, also cognition as measured by Stroop and SDMT, and then total motor score. For this, there was not only maintenance of function, but improvement from baseline all the way out to one year. And then after that, at every single time point, predopidine uh, group was really better than placebo. This was mirrored in the individual studies themselves. We also had a measure for fine motor coordination, which is so important for eating, cleaning, brushing your teeth, doing up your buttons, things that are important for patients. And Q-Motor, again, showed uh, a significant uh, improvement compared to placebo, and this was maintained essentially significantly above baseline all the way out to week 78. In addition, there was preservation of quality of life for patients with Huntington disease. So all of these uh, were, again, very encouraging results, very promising. And we've discussed these results with the regulators in Europe. And they have told us that they would be uh, essentially willing to accept and take into review a marketing authorization for approval for Huntington, for predopidine in Europe. Doesn't mean we'll get it, it's just a, a submission. And we will be doing this uh, later in the next few months. In terms of the United States, 
we have ongoing discussions with the regulators to determine the right path forward. Of course, when you go for submissions for approval, it's important to note, yes, there's a probability of success, but it's not a sure thing. But you have to have a context for all of this. In Huntington's disease, everything gets worse. Uh, in this disease. Here we saw maintenance and improvement from baseline for each at least a year in pretty much all of these outcomes and we also then went it because there have been other studies with, with predopidine but it's been never looked at without ADMs, without these antidopaminergics and this was uh, again additional independent analysis done independently and here we saw again significant impact on total functional capacity, CUHDRS, uh, Stroop for cognition was maintained. All of them again showed improvement uh, and then improvement over placebo all the way out to week 78. And so this was replication and consistent effects in two different analyses. Uh, this was uh, exciting and we'll be discussing all of this data with the regulators in the near future. I would just say it's been a long time that there's never been uh, any drug that offers any hope. There's one perspective that I didn't add, that when you look for drugs you want to look at risk benefit. That is important. So what's the risk here with predopidine? There's essentially no risk because the safety has been seen in 1500 patient years and the drug has a placebo-like safety profile. And that's important both for ALS and for Huntington disease where these diseases are so progressive and profound and debilitating and dehumanizing. So these are diseases that when you study these patients they grab, grab your, uh, your mind but they also grab your heart because the the debilitation and progressive nature of this disease is devastating and it's agonizing for the family members who watch their family members become not the person that they knew as parents, as partners, as grandparents. This drug offers hope and we hope to be able to fulfill that hope for patients and families uh, all over the world.